breaking news and trending talk with Mike and McCarty. Mornings on 1017 FM and 710 Kiel. Oh, thank goodness it's for fr- fr- Friday. But uh, for some people, it's going to be a long weekend, and that includes our buddy, uh, Keith Bryant, with the Shreveport Volunteer Network. Good morning, my friend. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all? We're, we're good. You doing are good. Um, you're doing um, collecting stuff to take to the hurricane-hit areas. Tell us what you guys are doing and what you need from our community. All right. First of all, I want to say thank you to all of our uh, local Shreveport and Bossier um, supporters. I know it says Shreveport Volunteer Network, but we're really uh, Northwest Louisiana Volunteer Network. We've uh, so many uh, volunteers and and people support us from all over. So we want to say thank you, guys. We out y'all. Uh, we couldn't be who we are today, and of course God too. But. Uh, a little victory last time we were able to to carry down 430,000 pounds of supplies to Tampa um, and we were distributing them from Tampa from the river church there that was just a couple of years ago and so uh, who knows what the Lord has in store again we started uh, yesterday uh, we took in our first intake of Hurricane Milton supplies it was a, a 48 pallets of supplies that we're fixing to be um, uh, distributing out and, and hauling to Florida. Wow. What What is needed? Where can folks drop things off? Uh, today, uh, our donation drives are going to be today and tomorrow, uh, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. tonight, and uh, Saturday, 8 to 10. Um, and, you know, if you, you guys don't have anything that you can donate, you can come and hang out with us. You can come and pray with us. You can come and help us, um, you know, um, load organize the trucks, the, yeah. mm-hmm. load the trucks and organize the warehouse and, and organize everything that's coming off. Uh, the supplies are, the, the need is great. Um, and obviously the most important thing right now would probably be, um, you know, of course, water and Gatorade. Staying hydrated after a storm is probably one of the, the biggest causes of, of illness after a storm is, uh, people are stressed and they just get, um, you know, dehydrated and overworked. Um, some of the other things that we have, we have on our Facebook uh, page. You can go there to look. The, the list is huge. A lot of people's uh, lives will be uh, changed forever after this storm. And so, uh, you know, everything from socks to, to to underwear to toilet paper is going to be needed. Cleaning uh, supplies, are, too, is going to be a big thing, right? Cleaning supplies. <laughs> cleaning supplies. I'm sorry. No problem. I got one too. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Braden. Uh, <laughs> Morning, big boy. Give him a kiss for me. Yeah, yeah Bra- Braden just walked in and the dog answered him. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so cleaning supplies um, to get things, you know, to get their houses kind of back to livable, huh? Yes. Yes, for sure. Cleaning supplies. We are not uh, accepting food um, or clothing, uh, we're going, our mission that we're hauling over there is we're going to be hauling, uh, three pieces of heavy equipment. One of those is going to be a track hoe with a, uh, grapple saw on it. So we can pull trees off of houses and, um, the other two will be skid steers to move debris. Wow. So we also need, uh, monetary donations to be able to get, uh, to Florida. Which would pay for some of the fuel and some of the things that you, you know, you, you need, to get your jobs done. Yes, for sure. Last uh, The last storm a couple of years ago, we went with $57,000, and we were able to do about $300,000 worth of uh, free uh, tree removal and, and debris removal from people's yards. People that don't know, your Shreveport Volunteer Network location is right there on the, on the south side of the old South Park Mall, right? Yes, ma'am. The southwest corner of the old South Park Mall. And thank you to Summer Grove Baptist Church for giving us a church home. Uh, we've distributed out of that building uh, probably 2 million pounds of supplies. 
And we just want to say, man, we, we love Summer Grove Baptist Church and thanks for their support. Now, when are you guys leaving and where will you be head, headed back to Tampa, I would guess? Yeah, uh, we have boots on the ground there now. Um, we try to go to the places where everybody else doesn't um, because everybody wants to seem to flood to the ground zero where it hit. Right. Uh, but a lot of times the dirty side of the storm is uh, the most affected with the tornadoes and stuff. So we'll probably be off uh, the beaten path somewhere, okay. uh, sleeping in a tent and taking a um, a bath in a, in a five-gallon bucket somewhere. Wow. And so y'all will pull out after the Saturday final drop-off then at some point? Well, uh, we... We're not sure just yet. We okay. want to. We want to be able. We still have some data that we're collecting, and then um, and some needs. There's some. There's going to be some specific needs uh, that I can get to you after this. Okay. Um, uh, after we talk today, I'm not sure exactly. I, I have another list that's coming. Okay. And uh, we're we're just trying to be the um, most effective that we can with and be good stewards of what we've been given and the time that we've been given mostly. Okay, the drop-off times today again and tomorrow are what times? Uh, 5.30 to 7 p.m. Okay. And tomorrow, 8 in the morning till 10 a.m. Okay. It may change if we get some more volunteers that can come in and man uh, the warehouse, but we've been so stretched thin with all of the disasters and tornadoes and everything that we have been um, affected with, you know, a, a lot of our guys are just smooth wore out. I get it. I get it. And you can get all the details on your Facebook page. Look up Shreveport Volunteer Network. Get all the details. And if you can't drop off any supplies, but you say, you know what, I got 10 bucks, that'll buy a few gallons of gas. You can make a donation right there on the Facebook page. And every last cent helps, correct? For sure. And we also have another big need. We've been donated a uh, hundred rows of uh, of hay for cattle and uh, some horse feed. So we're going to need some transportation or some transportation funds for uh, hay to get to the Tampa Tampa Bay area. Oh, you just can't haul that in pickup trucks, right? Well, I mean, you can, but a lot you of pickup trucks. Can. Yeah. <laughs> but by the time you you know pay for a pickup truck to haul, you know, a couple right. rows of hay. You know, it might as well, you know, throw that money towards transportation cost of a 18-wheeler. Absolutely. Anybody that's got access that could let you let you guys use or, or do the driving and drive the hay down there, that would be very much appreciated. Keith Bryant. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. For sure. And if, it, and if anybody has a truck and trailer and no driver, I ha, I am a CDL driver. Okay. And we could I, could I could get it hauled if somebody has a truck and trailer sitting. Wonderful. I'm sure we will help find something like that for you. And, uh, again, today, at, right there at the backside of South Park Mall, 530 to 7, tomorrow 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., whatever you can do to help, they would appreciate it. I, God bless you, my friend. Y'all do God's work, that's for sure. And we can't thank you enough. Thank you. Love you guys. Love you too, my friend. Day. You bet. Take care. 1017 FM 710 Keel. Let's get back to the show with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Keel. Okay, Mike is off today. Uh, my friend Scott Hughes has arrived and he'll be in the in the big in the hot seat in a minute. And I got to ask him about something that I, I'm going to throw this out there to you today. Um, if you're a Bossier resident, I don't know if you're keeping up with the term limits. It's it's really hard to follow, to be quite blunt. Um, some council members have been adamantly opposed to putting term limits on the ballot for the voters to decide. Others have been adamant. They want the voters to decide on term limits. They have a charter commission panel that's been working on charter changes because we know the Bossier City Council needs, um, the, the, commit, the charter for Bossier needs major uh, changes and renovations. So where we get to with yesterday's meeting, which started at 335, and I did find out the reason it started at 335 was because the notice of it had to be put out, you know, 24 hours in advance. And the notice of the meeting um, didn't go out until the day before at some claim 336. And some say it went out at 335. You know, I don't know the technicality of that. But the Bossier 
clown car, I mean, council meeting yesterday was Scott Hughes. Was You watched it, right? Um, yes, I did. That's part of my life. I'll never get back. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, 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 without, without calling out either side, it was one of the worst public governmental meetings I've ever had a, a chance to witness. I watched it online. I was not in, not in the building. And, and to be fair, there were not a lot of people there. And so mm-hmm. you can see the video feed. So I do want to make that clear. It wasn't like this auditorium was packed with hundreds of no, people. No, there's a couple of dozen. Maybe, maybe. a dozen, yeah. dozen and a half folks. And, they, and many of them were there for another issue, which I actually found more interesting than the charter issue. I know. The appointment of Mary Ward. Mary Lowry the, Ward, who many know, yes. basketball player, coach. Um, now is going to apparently be heading Bozier Parks and Recreation at some point in the future. That was sort of weird as well. Shame on them for how they treated her, for crying out loud. That was ridiculous. But the, do you know how it ended? Can you sit here and tell me, here's what they did yesterday. Here's what's going to happen next month. Yeah. December. Okay, explain it to me. In a nutshell, for those who are not up on the Bossier Council, there's been a long, there's actually been two, two parallel efforts to try and get what they term as term limits. Mm-hmm. One has been a citizen's petition, and that's been going on for a couple of years, actually. There was a petition that was signed, a petition that was turned in and rejected, and they redid the petition. So the second petition really is the one that's now on a track, and that's actually been presented to the council and now is in court. Right. That's petition A, the citizen's petition. There was also a citizen's charter review committee, which was seated by the council that has been meeting Lots of questions now around that, such as, was it even legal? Were there meetings public? So there's a lot of concern on the work product of that commission. They also put out recommendations that included something about um, changes to term limits. So those two things are going on. In the middle of that, it appears that what the council now has done is taken preemptive action on their own what I'll call third attempt at at term limits. The council basically said, and I'm paraphrasing and being nice here, those other ones are ongoing. And so while those go on, we'll go ahead and propose our own term limits. So they proposed a resolution, not an ordinance, because an ordinance takes multiple weeks, and that's in the works apparently. Yep. But they proposed a resolution that says, we support the bond issue putting us on the ballot in December, like a couple of weeks. Um, for a term limit vote, and they passed that resolution. Because well, the deadline to get it to the bond is commission tomorrow, is Monday, I yeah, think. Yeah, they have a meeting Monday, so, so they had the, to do it. All the bond commission needs is a resolution. This got, this became a point of contention. They don't need an ordinance. They don't need the ordinance yet. They need right. the ordinance before the official vote, but they need a resolution showing the governmental body supports the ordinance or the plan. So this is in many ways politically brilliant on the council's standpoint because mm-hmm. the council now is preempting the other two efforts by putting their own term limits on the ballot, except the one the council put on is what in government terms we call prospective. Yep. It is a standard term limits bill that says we'll put this on the ballot, meaning anyone who is elected on or after January 1st, 2025, then can only serve two terms. And they'd have to be off. Three, right? Um, and, and, and maybe it's three. That's, okay, that's yeah. where I, I have not read the actual it's okay. new ordinance. And so this is, they get confused. Could only serve so many terms. We'll right. say that. And then they could, they could be off and come back and serve again. A standard term limits bill like we see everywhere mm-hmm. else. And so they are putting that out, hoping that the citizens will effectively change the charter, make that the rule. And then that might make the other two go away. Um, now, the difference is the other two, the Citizens Charter Review Committee and the petition, they want to be retroactive. They both want to go back and pass a version that says anyone that's already served two terms can never serve again. Right. And I think you have a and I would join that crowd. I think there's, there's a concern on the constitutionality of that. <sighs> there's only one office. I think you and I have talked before. There's mm-hmm. only one office in the whole country that I'm aware of has that standard, and that's President of the yeah. United States because of the 22nd Amendment. Um, Duke Lowry is going to join us at 710. He, he, you know, he's going to talk about the meeting, what went on. We are also going to talk at, uh, in about 10 minutes. I want you to weigh in on uh, Fairgrounds Field.
No, I think we're cleaning it up, right? Um, we got another not hitch, so fast, my little friend. Giddy up, yeah. We'll I talk. saw a press release yesterday. <laughs> talk about that when we come back. One hundred one seven FM, seven ten Keel. Now more breaking news and trending talk with Mike and McCarty on one hundred one seven FM and seven ten Keel. We have a short segment here, Scott. Scott Hughes is in for uh, Mike Ma- Ma- Martindale. Yeah, that's his name. Mike Martindale. Mike Martindale. He is taking today and Monday off, having a long weekend, going over to Dallas. Um, we wish him all the best. Um, trick-or-treating for Halloween this year. Um, do you have any particular uh, traditions that you did as a when you were a dad and your girls were younger that you remember fondly you pull a wagon through the neighborhood did you did you physically dress up yourself too i didn't dress up for for halloween i would dress up occasionally for harry potter release nights ah when the books came out but okay. not for halloween um no what we would do is when my girls were younger we would dress them up and we would take them to their grandparents house Okay. And we would knock on the grandparents' door, we'd trick-or-treat, and then we'd do some houses around my, the grandparents' houses. Okay. As they got a little older, I think we actually did, and I heard you talking the other day about this, um, I live in I live in a, I, I love where I live, mm-hmm. in the middle part of town, but it's not a big trick-or-treating area. Okay. Um, and so we would go to the areas that are the good trick-or-treating areas mm-hmm. in Shreveport, Bossier now, primarily the so Broadmoor area. You were some, a poacher too. Some of the, some, some of the South Highland streets, that, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of where we live is the South Highlands area. So, but, but, there's, but there are some streets you trick-or-treat on and some you don't. Sure. Um, and then as they got even a little older, that's really when Halloween became an event. And people started having parties. My mm-hmm. girls are in their 20s now. Yeah. So you back up about a decade, and Halloween parties really were the, the growing thing. And now, I'm told now, Halloween, more people spend money on Halloween than many other um, yes, holidays. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of Potter, we're going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk Fairgrounds Field. But tonight is Harry Potter night at the Mudbugs. So wear your wizardry gear, and uh, they're going to have a big shindig on the ice. So, uh, again, Harry Potter night at the Mudbugs tonight. So have some fun if you're into Harry Potter. Fairgrounds Field next when we come back. Oh, boy, another chapter in that saga right here on Keel. Bye. Big stories of the day with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Keel. Okay. Um, Mike is out. Scott Hughes, my buddy, is in. Uh, thank you for being here, by the way. Good morning. Yeah, this is, I guess, part of my court-ordered service. Yeah, I think it is. I'm here at 6.30 in the morning. (laughs) Got some trash for you to pick up in the hall, too, by the way. Um, Fairgrounds Field. The mayor has told us uh, he wants it done, the demolition done, by December 28th, the date of the Independence Bowl. We're not going through that again. Nope. And the bids are in. The low bidder was $334,000, I believe, a Dallas-based company. Underestimate. Underestimates, which is a good thing. A uh, contract is not yet signed, the mayor said, but they're close. And then the work could start in weeks. Does it have a clawback clause on the, the bats? <laughs> I don't know. But the, there's a little hitch in the giddy up because if you notice at Fairgrounds Field, the state fair is now staging just to the north of Fairgrounds Field. Correct. And and, and um, the guys are coming in, setting up the rides and, and, and the attractions. I think the mayor, I heard his interview with you yesterday, and I think he implied he is trying to fit into that sweet 40-day window between the state fair and the Independence Bowl. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be some work done before the state fair starts because they could start some work on the south side. You know, knocking some of those walls because it's a 60 day project. Well, and, and, and I think to be fair to both sides of where we're headed, there's two parts of the cleanup. There's parts that aren't going to be contested at all. The outfield fence, mm-hmm. the lighting poles. There are some things that can be done now that do not get into the questionable area. Right. But when you start getting into the concrete structure, the enclosed building mm-hmm. spaces, the roofs where the bats were, are remained. Yeah. I think that's where we're going to get again. It sounds like this is Groundhog Day. We're back to where we were. Got another letter yesterday. I don't know if you've seen it yet from Attorney Jerry Harper. I have. Claiming that there's still an issue with bat guano up there. And he, they don't think the city has 
dealt with it appropriately. And they claim that the demo ball, the wrecking ball, will stir up the bat guano dust and cause a health hazard in the neighborhood. They seem so concerned now for the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. That because I don't want to be a cynic here, but we've been down this path and, and we dealt with all of that. And when I read, when I read, and I, and I know Jerry Harper, he's a very good attorney. And, mm-hmm. and attorneys are attorneys. They represent their clients. I get that. So I don't want to disparage Mr. Harper because he's just the, the spokesperson, the mouth, I guess, now sure. for the Friends of Fairground Field. But we've already been down this issue. We, we've dealt with it. And a lot of what their argument seems to be is, well, wait a second. This said you had to use cursive I's and T's and dot those I's and T's by hiring this type of a person. And yes, you did all that stuff, but maybe you didn't hire the right people to do it. That seems to be huh. the, the fundamentals. And they're saying, once again, we're worried about the health. I, I'm curious, what has Fair, Friends of Fairgrounds feel done to improve that community or the health of all the neighbors that they seem to be once again so concerned about now that the demo ball may come out? Hmm, good point. Good point. What, what what other development projects have they instituted or money have they put up? And and I'm, I'm not taking sides here. I just think we reach a point where we've got to make a decision and move on. And, I, and, and I'd be willing to bet if we polled the community, that's where the community is. This right. is a closed issue in the community's mind. We had this conversation two years ago. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the mayor was very clear. He wasn't against renovating that stadium. I believe he came on your show and said the following. Before I became mayor, I gave you a list of items that you could do that I would discuss with you, like a mm-hmm. five-person checklist. Sure. Since I've been mayor, you have failed to do any of the things on that checklist. Right. And they, they keep having this, this conversation about saving it, and they keep talking about the partnership they're going to put together. But I, 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 this is where I'm going to side with the mayor. I think the mayor's been very fair. He's been very consistent. And he said, these are the things you must do. And the Friends of Fairground Field have not done that. And we've no. reached a point now. And, and the other one I always think is interesting, the Friends of Fairground Field like to point to the fact that the citizens of, of Shreveport failed to pass part of a bond issue that would have demoed Fairgrounds Field. And they, they somehow think that means that we shouldn't demo Fairgrounds Field. The citizens of Shreveport also failed to pass fire and police funding. Would they suggest that we should close the fire and the police department? No. I think the citizens just didn't want to spend more money. They want right. to see the city just get rid of it. And that's where I think the citizens are. And um, it'll be very interesting to see if the Friends of Fairgrounds Field can get another court order on the same thing. Yeah. And start this whole legal process all over again. Um, you know, and the mayor says he's he's moving forward. Full steam ahead. Wrecking ball is coming. And it'll be torn down. As, as I, I like to remember, the mayor is an attorney. The last yeah. mayor had gone to law school. This mayor is an attorney. Absolutely. Practiced for a long time in municipal law as well. He knows all about, yeah, the suing cities and defending cities. He knows all about that stuff. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, I'm, waiting, I'm, I'm waiting for them to let me know they've signed the contract. Because then, the, for me, the 60-day clock ticks. Because you're going to have weather delays. You know, it's going to rain in November around here. So is it really going to be gone by, de, by the Independence Bowl? That's what I'm questioning. And I'm wondering if that's going to happen. If I'm a betting man, I, I will go out on a limb and say, I bet we see significant demolition by Independence Bowl. Mm-hmm. There may be a few things left, especially if we're fighting about the old original concrete structure, you know, the field house kind of building. Sure. But we might see everything else gone pretty quickly. There just seems to, it's going to be hard to dispute the out. I mean, and that may be where they split hairs. We may right. say, fine, we'll slow down on this one little part that you're concerned about for health, mm-hmm. but we're getting rid of the rest of the facility, which then makes the Fairgrounds Field, Friends of Fairgrounds Field's um, argument moot if everything else is gone. Yeah, absolutely. Duke Lowry is going to join us at 710. We're going to talk about what the Bossier City Council did yesterday. That is coming up. 1017 FM, 710 Keel. American Giant makes great clothing. T-shirts, jeans, and more right here in the U.S. Creating jobs in towns and cities across the country. Support America's workers and get 20% off your first order at American-Giant.com with code STAPLE20. Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Kiel. I'm wondering this morning when we've got uh, information about the, a fire at the Jolie Apartments. 
That's the old Quail Creek. Yes, off Shreveport Barksdale Highway. There's a fire there, possibly caused by vagrants. We don't know. Units there now, as mm-hmm. Gary McCoy was reporting. Yes, absolutely. It makes me wonder, if you recall, a few weeks back, the city council decided not to extend the mayor's emergency declaration, uh, which gave the police department and public works and what's the property standards, the right to go on those properties because the and council felt the emergency's over. They felt we've done our, our work here is done. Mm, Was that what they said? No, nah, not quite. Oh, what happened? They were comparing it to the police headquarters. And like, you want an emergency at these properties, but yet we've got property crumbling that we own. Oh, so me mad at A, so we take it out on you on B. Is that is that kinda, what you think is happening? That's kind of what happened. That's now not the, smart. That's not smart governance. Um, it's really not. Now, the Jolie was not included in this latest emergency declaration extension, but it has me wondering if one of these apartment complexes that we no longer have an emergency declaration on, if there's a fire and somebody dies... And, you know, police and property standards say we we weren't allowed to go on the property and run people off because you didn't extend the emergency declaration. Who's that on? The property owner first. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, well, of let's course. do go there. Now, of course. I think one of the issues you're going to get into is that the property owner has not been doing anything. And I think under public safety, the mayor, and with the support of the city council, mm-hmm. at least initially, apparently, now maybe the things have changed. But I think the mayor felt the need to step in because the property owner was not doing anything. And this is not like my property or 17 Keel's business here, Mm -hmm. okay? This is property where we had known vagrancy, where we had known things going on that were life-threatening situations. Mm -hmm. I think that's why you go to extraordinary powers. Yeah, Um, there's shootings happening. There's fires being started. There's not shootings and fires and all that happening at the police headquarters. So, so to compare the two, I think, was disingenuous. It, it, it is. And, and, and I think now the concern is going to be you moved in. And we really, let's be honest, from a per public's perspective, those six properties primarily, but some of these, they kind of went back burner for a couple of months. So they whatever, have. whatever was going on was working. They, that they, that we had cleaned out a bunch of the people. Mm-hmm. I think we were monitoring them. You don't see as many people moving in. Well, now this morning we have a fire at the Jolie. We, now, be fair, we don't know what happened. We, we don't, don't know. We, I think it's fair to say there's no electrical running there. So it's sure. probably nothing like that. These are typically fires that are started inside of a building for heat, warmth, or cooking. Mm-hmm. and then Or just for um, um, just someone doing it just to do it. Right. And, that, and that's going to become a problem as we get colder. We're going to see these fires starting at these other apartment complexes. And I, you know, I would urge the council, you might want to rethink that emergency order because then you give the city and all its departments the right to go on those properties and tell people to get out. Y'all need to move on. You're not allowed here. Right now, you don't have that authority. Well, and, and so you're putting it back in the property owner, which means you're creating a potential known situation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 1017 FM, 710 Keel. Duke Lowry will join us coming up in about 12 minutes. We're going to be talking about the Bossier City Council and term limits. What did they do? That is ahead right here. 1017 FM, 710 Keel. Happy Friday. Scott Hughes in for Mike Martindale today. And on the Shreveport Security Systems, um, no, the Jack Spring Electric Newsmaker Hotline. Ruben, don't say it wrong again. Duke's on the other line, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Duke Lowry is joining us. Um, Bossier City Council Clown Car Circus uh, had, an, had a special meeting yesterday. Um, they did they to say they passed term limits on to the voters is not quite accurate at this point right not in my humble opinion i mean uh, the version of the crazy duke show as described in the meeting yesterday uh was uh there was something for everybody um if you if you wanted to see a government body uh trying to uh, take a shot at women uh that was uh there for you um, if you wanted to see a government body uh, breaking open meeting laws, uh, you, that, you had that. That was your dish. Um, but term limits, uh, no. And so I, I want to point out, and, and I know... 
Scott has made some comments in the past, and, and he has a little bit of a different view. But you heard the city assistant city attorney making a lot of comments yesterday, and, and I think he was referencing maybe what I said on the show yesterday. And I sent you, he, he said in that meeting, he said, this is not a new charter. I sent you last night Mm -hmm. from the January 30th, 2024 video of him speaking to the Charter Commission meeting where he clearly lined out to to the Charter Commission members that they would be creating a new charter. He said it in his own words. And he and then he said yesterday in that meeting, he told the council, the citizens of Bossier, that that's not true. He didn't say that. I mean, the the video doesn't lie. Mm hmm. I want to I want to show some something else. I sent you two more screenshots. The uh, the propositions or or the product that the Charter Commission uh, formed and voted on at their last Charter Commission meeting to send to the council. You know, it's the first screenshot. They had they had two things, and when I said on your show yesterday that. Um, the people's petition that's in the Second Circuit Court right now that comes back would be dead on arrival upon the adoption of a new charter. I was saying that based off of what the Charter Commission voted on. But and he said he that, got I up said, yesterday. The assistant city attorney and said, "No, the the term limits would be it would be enacted in whichever charter passes by the voters." That that's right. But but look at look at that first thing that came from the charter. And tell me where it says the the language that he used yesterday in the meeting because it doesn't say it. So from so the city council what what they put forward as a resolution is not what the charter commission sent to the city council. So you think he completely lied to the city council yesterday? I mean, won't they go back on him and say, no, this is not what you told us back on October tenth? I'm not going to say that he lied because. What he was saying in the resolution, what the resolution that they were voting on, it said exactly that. That's not the point. But the but the the charter commission amendments that they sent to the council are not what they voted on in the resolution. And I I want to add in the original ordinance to found the charter commission. I'm going to read a line out of it. The city council shall not alter or change the recommendations of the Charter Review Commission and shall call for an election for citizens to adopt or reject any recommended revisions at the next election while by losing the law. Mm -hmm. All one has to do, go look at what the Charter Commission voted on, where there is no, no, nothing in there that talks about uh, a proposition will apply to a newly constituted revised charter or an old charter. That language is not in there. But, but, if, but, but if you look at... Go ahead. Duke, I, I think one of the issues, and I don't know if you heard the early segment we were on early, early, is I, I think you're correct. I think what I heard the city attorney say last night is there's actually been three efforts. There is the citizen petition effort. There is the charter commission effort. And what I saw yesterday was the city council now preempting all of that. They've put a different version, a third version, a, a perspective going forward um, term limits on. And I think Councilman Chris Smith really summed that up in his comments in the closing part where he acknowledged this was not what he wanted when he ran. This is not what he thinks the Charter Commission adopted. But it is, it is, it is term limits, and he voted to support it last night because it is something. So I think you are correct in that they didn't put on the, the city char- the, the, the Charter Commission's version, but they did put their own version. And what I heard the city attorney saying was, that if the city char- if the city council does this and it passes, then it would go into any charter. It would be in the charter, which also could simultaneously be changed with other documents. Well, w- words matter and the details matter. And, and for instance, on the people's petition, you know, and you heard yesterday, um, and this is where I think Scott, in the past, you. Um, had had a little bit of disagreement. I think you described the people's petition as being unconstitutional. And Charles Jacobs and even Richard Ray articulated yesterday that there's no uh, historical, um, you know, account of 
any term limits per se or, or retroactivity law that, you know, shortened the term. But 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 but, but Duke provision. words matter. He also be fair. He also very clearly articulated this has never been done. It's been done this way everywhere in the country because of the exact issue of it probably is unconstitutional. So let's let's be fair. Words matter. I mean, you're correct. I have said okay. that for a reason because the law and the history of this has upheld my opinion. And there's only one office in the entire country, and you're a very smart man, and you know it. It's the president of the United States. It's the only office in the entire country with these terms. Retroactive lifetime oh. ban. Name me another okay. office in the entire country that has a that has a that has a retroactive. You can no longer run, and you have a lifetime ban once you've served your term. That's the point the city attorney made. 1981, Jefferson Parish, the people of Jefferson Parish petitioned and got a proposition to amend their home rule charter to change their existing districts from all at-large council seats to district seats. It passed, and all of the sitting council members lost their seats. That's a change of district. I don't believe I don't believe you or the petition or the citizens committee has proposed changing the districts. In fact, since you want to count my words, I also pointed out that none of you good government folks, which I count myself as well, has said a peep about the at large <laughs> districts, which I think you just brought up the case study in Louisiana that's now used that show out that show at large districts actually are viewed unconstitutional more and more throughout the country, that more people go to representative districts. So that's not apples to right. apples, the case you just used. So thank you for bringing it up. Right, right. And, and, and that's the, that is the contention that I think they are making is that you're trying to you know, end the ability of these sitting city councilmen to be able to run again. And it, we're going to get the answer uh, again. A judge is going to have to make that decision. I, I would on the, on the petition hated. and or on the citizen. The petition is the one in court, correct? The citizens' petition. Correct. So, and, so, and so we'll, we'll, we'll get an answer on the citizens' petition. And I will agree with you. The charter is very clear. It says the city council shall present that. So that's going to be a good legal question to get answered. And then we haven't had a resolution yet on the city charter commission's proposal that has not even come to the commission yet to the to the council yet and it looks like to me that they are now going to put a third version out there which looks like to me it's going to go to the people in december they passed the resolution assuming they come back and pass the ordinance there will be something on the ballot in december do we agree on that at this point whether we agree that it's the, that's what you want or not is something going to be on the ballot in december well, I, I think that they have a hurdle to overcome and that uh, the bond commission, the ad hoc bond commission on Monday is probably going to have some questions because, again, another uh, issue is the, the Bossier City Charter. You know, Section 2103 of the charter, it says each amendment, however proposed, may include more than one subject of the charter, provided that it relates to a single subject that must be clearly expressed in the title. I would ask you, in the first proposition that the council voted yesterday to send to the bond commission is the delineation of an A and B district, which is why Chris Smith supported you know, the, that. Is that the, the same as creating an IT department? Do you, are those the same? You know, if you think of it in the context of Section 21, however proposed may include more than one section of the charter, provided that it relates to a single subject but, is the IT department. Okay, Duke, we're get, we, we, we got to stay on. We, we can't get too far out in the weeds because the general public yeah, right. needs to hear, am I going to vote on this on December 7th? And we still have a hurdle of they have to pass an ordinance too. And David Montgomery was notably absent. He is not for term limits. Is he going to come back and is an ordinance ultimately going to pass? Will voters get to decide this? And Duke is correct. The other hurdle is the bond commission. You bet. Yeah, they're, they're going to pass the ordinance. That That's going to happen. Um, I think at this point the only hurdle they have is the bond commission uh, Monday. Uh, and I can tell you there's going to be – a lot, all these arguments are going to be made, and then you still have the potential for litigation to answer a lot of these questions. I, I think that's going to happen. And so let me ask this question, Duke, because I'm curious, because it appears to me the council has now passed an, a resolution, 
Okay, that took place yesterday. It's going to the bond commission to ask the state bond commission to put a term limits vote on the Bozier ballot. And so what I'm hearing from you is you believe there will be an organized effort by the term limits people against putting a term limits vote on the ballot because it's not the one you want. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, not necessarily because you want, but, you know, is it is it following the law? The city charter says that, you know, what the, the charter commission sends to the council shall not be changed. It, it, it won't be changed. Clearly, what the charter commission sent to the city council, it's different. It is not the same. All you have to do is compare compare the two. The, look at the the minutes of the last charter commission meeting. Look at the resolution that the council voted on yesterday. They are not the same. So you're so let me ask the follow-up the, the follow question then. So your contention by the charter, because you want to now split the letter of the law and the rules, and I agree with that. So you, so you contend all the meetings and all the process that created the city charter commission were also legal under the city charter. I, I think it's questionable. I, I heard one of the members. So now uh, you'd like to push that, forward something that you just admitted is questionable. If was, was it legal under the charter? Because it's it's very legal under the charter. The city council could send forth their own proposal. That's a hundred percent legal. But now you want to you're, you're making an argument that they should. They, and I agree. The charter does say they shall send a commission recommendation forward. But if that wasn't. In, in proper form, can they send it forward? I do want to ask one question, Duke, if I can. Uh, what what is, are, are you in favor of the other amendments? We talk a lot about the term limits. What about the other things the Charter Commission put out? Are you in favor of those, the other chip proposed changes? I mean, I think it's long overdue. I can see both sides of the argument on the division of the A and B, although that is piled into the, the first proposition that the council put forward. Um, I, you know, I'm really kind of indifferent. I like it. Um, at, at the end of the day, some form of term limits in Bossier City, you know, if, if the people's petition ends up failing, will, will I be happy with having the term limits as proposed? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I, I don't think anybody in Bossier City wouldn't be. Duke, um, got, we, we got to take a break. We're up against the clock. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, we got to revisit it again next week. I'm sure there's going to be more discussion after the bond meeting. Thank you, Duke. Always appreciate the dialogue. Yeah. Uh, thanks, you guys. You bet. Take care. 1017 FM, 710 Keel. Back to the show with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Keel. So if I live in Bossier, it's going to be on the ballot on December 7th if dot, dot, dot. What happens? If you live in Bossier City. This is potentially going to be on the December ballot. I think Duke and I did agree on this. There are two hurdles they have to get over. The biggest one is going to be the bond commission. And the bond commission is the one that actually sets what goes on the ballot. What's their hurdle? They got the resolution. They call the election. I think the hurdle is going to be, according to Mr. Lowry, that there may be organized opposition at the bond commission. But the bond commission very likely is going to have, and I think it's Monday. I think mm-hmm. what they're going to have Monday down in Baton Rouge is they're not going to have a resolution from the governmental body, the city council, that says we would like to put this on the December agenda. Yeah, they are. Boom. They're going to have a resolution. They passed it yesterday. And there's going to be some citizens in the audience going, wait, we don't want that version of term limits. We want this version of term limits. But that's what the council passed, this version. And that's the resolution the bond commission is going to get. And to be and fair, Mr. Lyre raises, a, there are there are legitimate points of law on mm-hmm. all three of the issues, on the citizens petition, on the, on the charter commission version, and now the council version. All three are going to have potential issues of law that can be litigated. But if you're the bond commission, I'll be curious to see what they do. That is, the bond commission is traditionally chaired by the state treasurer. Mm-hmm. That's John Fleming. Yep. Um, John Fleming will have some connection to some of the folks, I think, um, that, that are that are on the, the, the charter side. But he also has great connection to Bossier City. Mm-hmm. And um, it'll be curious to see what they do. The bond commission normally defers to the elected body. Yeah. They know it. They know every municipality and, and, the, and the world has pros and cons. Right. And so it'll be interesting to see if that, that resolution and our holds la- weight. And our last minute, though, if the people's petition wins ultimately and December 7th, Bozier voters have voted on this term limits package, but this p- people's petition passes saying you have to put this on the ballot because the Charter Commission passed it, do we cha- could term limits be changed again? We've yeah, only got my a little 30 seconds. Is yes, is that they would be establishing ter- if the December one were to pass, 
they would be establishing term limits of however many terms for mm-hmm. those who are running now. The problem is the election for the next set of officers is this spring. Yep. So whatever they would do in December will determine who can run in the spring. If later this citizen's petition comes out of court and is ruled to be valid and it has to be put on the ballot, it'll be put on the ballot probably in the summer or the fall, Mm -hmm. which now means you would be amending the newly amended charter. That's what the city attorney (laughs) was trying to say. It is a a new charter in the sense you made a change. Sure. It's re-engrossed, to use the legislative term. Right. But you then would be amending that, the current rule for term limits, to the per, the retroactive term limit okay. rule, but they would have all been reelected, which right. is why this group's mad because they're all going to get to run again if this passes, and not they want. There's an element that wants them not to be able to run for election. Okay, and I wow. don't have a position on that other than I do believe retroactivity has been shown as, and even Duke I think brought up the potential that example in Louisiana. You traditionally cannot go back and eliminate elected officials. Yeah. Okay. When we come back in about ten minutes. The the Shreveport Council's been telling Bozier, hold my beer. But yet, now Bozier's telling... Uh, Shreveport Council's got a mess on their hands, too, delaying the sale of bonds. I should, want to talk about that when we get back. Should they both get together for happy hour now? Is they that- Yeah, they need to go, yeah, do something. Do some shots, some of them. We'll talk about that coming up in about 10 minutes. 1017 FM, 710 Key. Breaking news and trending talk with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Key. When we get back, we're going to talk about the Shreveport Council stuff that's been going on. It's been kind of interesting watching what they're doing. They're kind of um, pulling a kind of a little power play with the mayor. But I want to ask you something silly first. It, we're getting chilly. We're going to be maybe in the 50s tonight. I'm excited. I know. I'm loving it. It's red beans time. It's gumbo yeah, time. I wanted to ask you that because they say the top three things that we want to eat in Louisiana when it gets cold. Gumbo's number one. Uh, some nice soups are, are second on the list, and red beans and rice is third. Oh, I put red beans as number one. Me too. Red beans and rice is at the top of the list. Now, I love gumbo, but I'm not good at making gumbo. Right. There's, a, there's all kinds of things that go into that. People, mm. are you are you chicken and sausage? Or are yeah. you seafood? <laughs> right. I'm chicken and sausage in case anybody wants to drop something by. <laughs> But red beans. I love red beans. My wife does great red beans. She gets up. They cook all day. Oh. There's an expectation. She put a ham bone in it, too, I, if you've got what, one. I don't know. It's a secret recipe. I can't share. Oh, you know? man. But, no, it's that time of year. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, there's, there's supposed to be some colder weather coming down from the Canadian side now. Okay, yeah. So. All right. Well, fall before, is here. Before, revel, revel weather. Yeah. Too, yeah. too soon or too late? <laughs> I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to the revel tomorrow. Yeah, you, yeah you, you use Mike's... Um, <laughs> Extra, extra money. money, yeah, I'll do that. Absolutely, the Rebel was good. I, I think they had. They had a, oh, I think they had a good year. I did. No I did we did kidding. not make it this year for the first time in many years. They did have a good year, no doubt about it. Uh, city council action on the Shreveport side has been getting a little crazy. We're going to try to unpack all that when we get back. One hundred one seven FM, seven ten Keel. Back with more of Mike and McCarty on one hundred one seven FM and seven ten Keel. Okay, Scott Hughes, who's in for Mike Martindale. Um, We have to talk a little bit about what the Shreveport City Council has been doing. Um, And they have taken the action that they're taking because of the police headquarters. That's what that's what sparked all this. Um, More more concern about the dilapidated conditions at the SPD headquarters on Texas. And council members have said we have to move faster to get our people out of that building and get a new building built, get the substations built, and get moving on that. Which, let me up front say, that's a fair position. Yep. There's nothing wrong with that position. Mm-hmm. But do you then, now for the second straight meeting, delay the sale of bonds for future projects that you just passed in the most recent bond election? And they have done that. They have delayed selling the bonds, saying we're not going to sell any more new bonds until we see substantial progress on the work from the 2021 election. And, you know, I can't help but think, why weren't you doing this when we had the 2011 stuff still sitting there? 
Um, it, it, night Street, but the, I'll... The second part, I don't get as much. I think, yeah. well, I, I think it's a, this is my opinion. That's so why you bring me on here mm-hmm. and give opinions. Um, I think the first part's completely rational as the council. We're concerned. We're told it's worse than we thought it was. That that type of an approach. Sure. Um, and we want to see action. That's fine. Um, the accountability piece becomes interesting because when the accountability piece starts to become, we're now going to get down in the weeds. We're going to start withholding funding. We're going to start doing X. Well, now you're taking a problem that should 100% reside in the mayor's office. It's an administrative operational issue. Mm-hmm. The implementation of a plan. That plan includes bonds that we, the citizens, voted on. Bonds. Go do X. Well, now you're going to up, slow down and hold things up. At a certain point, you risk becoming the owner of the problem now. And the council's not well fitted. Most councils are not well fitted to get in the operation of cities. That was, we keep mentioning Bozier. That's part of Bozier's problem. Bozier, and, and, I, and I will say this, I think Bozier probably needs to let go of some of the things they're, they're, they're looking the mayor at. The Bozier Council is now getting into personnel, and that's a challenge. Mm-hmm. And now the Shreveport Council, which has traditionally deferred to the mayor, it's traditionally been a strong mayor form of government. They've let the mayor run the city. They've done the legislative side. They're now doing legislative acts or refusing to do legislative acts because they want to get in the operational side. Mm. And this is going to get troublesome. Were you shocked that it was a 7-0 vote? I mean, it was unanimous. Well, and, and, and let's, let's say that may not be a bad thing. Um, it's not partisan. It's not racial. So whatever the council is doing, whatever their political play is, they're unified in it. And, that, and I always think that's a good thing. I think mm-hmm. to have a, an elected body agreeing on something. Now, the part that's going to be interesting, I think you had Tom on your show yesterday or day before. Wednesday. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Wednesday. You had him on for the Ask the Mayor series. He made it very clear he and the police chief are on this problem. Right. But you're dealing with a situation here that's not going to be fast. I, I, and, and more and more, I'm wondering where the holdup is. Yeah. Because one thing I know about running the Realtor Association We have a lot of vacant buildings in the city of Shreveport right now. There's a lot of places that if you really wanted to move quickly, you could put the police right now in many, many places. And so I think that there's a, there's a, um, there's a, there's a book that was called good to great. It was a business book a couple years ago. I think it was a John, maybe a John Maxwell book. I can't remember the author, but good to great was the book. And the big lesson of that book is sometimes you fail to be good by trying to be great. Mm. And I think right now in our, in our search for the perfect solution, the great location, the perfect long-term solution, we may be avoiding a simple, easy answer. Right. And, um, and there seems to be a lot of simple, easy answers that hopefully Wayne Smith, Mayor Arsenault can find quickly because at the end of the day, what we don't want to get into would be the long-term politics of maybe the council playing long term we the citizens want to see things only gonna get more expensive right one other thing kind of related the north shreveport substation location is now kind of in a in a bit of a a turmoil because there's a deed restriction on there that says if you don't use this for police purposes for 25 years we the north shreveport business association can take the property back the property has a clawback clawback mm-hmm. clause which is not unusual um as, as was mentioned i think tom may have mentioned it many current cities have that people donate for parks for mm-hmm. schools um i was a trustee for the united methodist church for many years most churches have that some but the uh, council's bowing up saying why why should we spend a million and a half dollars on this building that if 20 years from now, we don't need a substation there, but we need SPAR offices that the North Shreveport group could then say, well, we want our property back. Well, and, and so that'll be up to the council. I will say this, those clauses are all over city contracts. Mm-hmm. And so I'd uh, be curious long-term if this is an issue. I think the North Shreveport Business Association, who I know very well, I know you, you and Mike go there frequently. Mm-hmm. They're, they're an outstanding organization. They've owned that land for a long time um, right there on North Market. They want to see it used for police. They have always supported the police. And what they don't want to do is donate that land and then have a new administration roll in here in three years and decide we're not doing substations. And then somebody owns or sells their land. So Mm -hmm. the clawback clause, the the second part, I would say, I I had this conversation with somebody yesterday. At the end of the day, you're building a million dollar building. Now, I I don't want to sound flippant because a million dollars is a million dollars, but we're not relocating city hall there. We're not building a hundred thousand square foot facility. We're building a basically a strip mall fire station is what's going to really be there. And if it's not being used in a couple of years, I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Um, But but if they don't go forward there, it might set back that project 
to be honest, a year. Okay. Going to talk LSU Ole Miss when we get back. 101.7 FM. Go Tigers. Keel. Get back to the show with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Kiel. Okay, LSU had a had a weekend off, and now we get into the I mean, we're getting into the grunt of the SEC race. It's a gauntlet. It really is. It, it becomes a gauntlet. And I saw an interesting comment the other night on ESPN, which I agree with. The LSU Old Miss game becomes one of the first playoff elimination games. Ooh. LSU and Old Miss are basically both sitting around 10 in the polls. If mm-hmm. you go forward, we are now going to have a 12-team playoff. Yep. Although it's not the top 12 because there's some conference winners that get in. Right. So to be safe, if you're in the top eight, the top six – probably in the ratings at the end of the season, mm-hmm. you're going to make the playoffs. Yeah. So if you have a one-loss old Miss, if you have a one-loss LSU squaring off in Tiger Stadium Saturday night, mm. it's probably loser out. Yeah, because a loser will drop out of the top 10, no doubt. Loser will drop into the 20s. <clears throat> can't With two losses, we'll probably not be able to get back in the top six. The winner okay. will have the right to move on. That's all, because you got to keep winning the gauntlet games. Uh, how do we match up with Ole Miss? I mean, have you done the the studies yet? Um, I like LSU's chances. There is a rumor, we'll wait and see on Saturday night, that Dart, that's the quarterback for Ole Miss, is not going to play. Ooh. Now, if Dart doesn't play, Ooh. I like our chances. Oh, big time. He can throw the ball. Now, remember, LSU has always played Ole Miss well. The game is in Tiger Stadium. LSU has an offense. LSU can score points. Mm -hmm. I think the defense is a little bit better than the last year's defense. Not stellar. It's getting better. Um, But I would like LSU's chances at home against Ole Miss. Now, if you don't know this and you've got a chance to go to the game, this will be one of the games that will be remembered forever because Saturday night we're celebrating 100 years of Tiger Stadium and they're doing a massive LED light show. So everybody on your seat, you're going to have this wristband you're going to have, and you're going to put the wristband on, and that's going to be part of the light show. Those are programmable. If you've been to a concert lately, a lot of those, we had one at the Pink concert. Taylor I think Swift Taylor uses does them. these, mm-hmm. Garth Books. A lot of the, the major concerts these days do those for multiple reasons. But one of the coolest things is they're programmable. They can yeah. blink purple. They can blink white. They can, they can say, let the band play. I don't know mm-hmm. what they're going to do. It's going to be an exciting night. Now, it's the first time these two teams have met in Tiger Stadium when they were both ranked in the top 10 since 1962. Did not realize that. There were some famous games back in the 60s yeah, between there these were. two. What was the... What was the um, Halloween night, Billy Cannon. Billy Cannon the, game. The famous yep. um, Billy Cannon run where he wins uh, the Heisman. Yeah. Um, as it turns out, both my parents were in the stadium that night. Wow. Not that married. was 59, wasn't it? Uh, that was, yeah, it was a little earlier than that. My dad was from Bogalusa and at LSU. He was went to LSU. And my uh, mom lived in Jennings and had come over with some family. And they were both in the state. They were two of the million people who now yeah. claim to be in the stadium, <laughs> yeah, exactly. but they actually were in the stadium. Absolutely. Golly, that's exciting. That's tomorrow, 6.30 kickoff. 6.30 kickoff, mm-hmm. national television. 1017 FM, 710 Keel. We are, what, three weeks away from the presidential election? This is a Tuesday election, so yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Inside it's a month. N- November 5th. Uh, early voting starts one week from today across ne- Louisiana. Next Saturday, I believe. Yeah. I, th- yeah, I thought Friday. But it maybe, maybe starts on a Friday. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, and it's every day except Sunday. Uh, and you've got two locations in Caddo. You can vote at the library on Burt Coons. And at the downtown. The, the South Hamilton yeah. Library, that one, yes. That's your registrar voters. The, I think Bozier's got a couple of locations And then as the well. courthouse annex, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, are people starting to pay attention yet? I mean, are you hearing the talk about the presidential election yet? I know people typically wait until the last minute to decide. I, I really think this time it's a little different. I think people are tuned in. I think they've been tuned in for a while. This is historic. You don't really have a lot of ground for a former president running again. 
um, especially in the modern era. Many, mm-hmm. you know, um, and so this has been a bi- this was a binary choice when Trump and Hillary ran. This was a binary choice when Biden and Trump. And I think we're we're back to the same thing, binary choice. So we've been doing the same election now for basically 10 years. Is it, and, and this is what worries me, is that it seems to be people making their mind up based on likability more than anything else. And that's frightening, Scott Hughes. Yeah, fact, facts don't seem to matter. And that really bothers me a lot because, as you know, I'm a fact-based guy. Mm-hmm. So I will, I'll put my caveat out before you walk me into deep water here, particularly <laughs> with your listening audience, because I always get bashed. But I like to point out, every day I read four newspapers. Every day I watch five television coverage shows, including Fox, including CNN and all the networks. I read the New York Times. I read the Baton Rouge Morning Advocate. I read this report Times. I read the Wall Street Journal Mm -hmm. and the Washington Post. I I watch podcasts. I do research. I'm a fact guy. That's my Mm -hmm. baseline. I start there. And when I say I read, I read the articles. I just don't look at what somebody sent me on Facebook with a headline, as you know, because I send you the articles. Sure. I read the articles. I do the research. I actually have printed copies of most of those papers that come to my house, which I would say that's where I think Americans have gotten off track. When we used to wake up and actually read a daily newspaper, we were more intelligent people because we would actually read stories and we would actually be aware of stories we weren't aware of. We weren't counting on some computer AI and our echo chamber social media to push things to us that are either false or slanted Mm -hmm. toward what we want to see. And when you flip through a daily newspaper, you see stories like earthquake in the Congo or a typhoon hit Japan or this or, oh, wait a second. There's a real conservative movement going on in Europe that's now affecting France and England and German politics. Mm-hmm. In my case, you read stories across the country. So I like to start out by saying whatever you're going to ask me coming here in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to give you fact based answers because okay. facts don't matter, especially when we start talking about economy and politics. People are going to vote their their emotion, I'm going to say right now, more than they're going to vote the common sense. And one thing that people are saying that they're going to vote is the, the old adage, am I better off now than I was four years ago? And you're hearing a lot of people say, no, I'm struggling. Business owners are saying they're having to live off their savings. They're having to borrow money. Um, families can't buy the same groceries they could buy four years ago and that's going to be their deciding factor well let me walk you through that real quick because i because i paid a lot of attention to messaging frank luntz is one of the guys i love to follow if you know politics you know frank luntz he's the best pollster he's the best wordsmith guy in the business um and, and so i've watched a lot of this language and so if I, if I look at, we'll look at the former president, Donald Trump. I think his campaign is probably the biggest part of this whole thing that's been driving. Because he's been campaigning now for, you could argue, four years, at least three years. Mm-hmm. He's been actively campaigning. If I go back a year, Donald Trump's fundamental message was three things. His fundamental message was the other guy's too old, the border, and the economy. Mm-hmm. That was the message a year ago. Well, if you come forward six months ago, right before Biden gets out, okay? You come forward six months, there was a slight shift in that. He was still going with the other guy's too old, okay? Sure. And now maybe demented. He'd add a few comments. The border had an important shift because a year ago, it was all about the border. We sent troops from Louisiana to the border. You saw video. Sure. You haven't seen a picture from the the border in six months, have you? No. No, because no one's crossing it. Uh, in, in practical terms. Mm-hmm. They could put a camera there and you're not going to see the people coming across. That's changed. So it's shifted from being... And the, folks will say that's changed because it's an election year. Well, it, it just, I'm just telling you the reality. The mm-hmm. verbiage shifted from being about the border to being about immigration. Slight shift in the political policy. Now it was about immigration in that category. And then the economy became about inflation. Because the economy was doing fine. Stock market, jobs are coming back. Matter of fact, and these, these are facts, the Biden administration has the largest growth in jobs. In the, and then some of that's bounced back from COVID. But we've gone well beyond that now. Mm-hmm. So the economy argument shifted to inflation. Because inflation is what was hurting people at the grocery store. Eggs mm-hmm. were more. Gas was more. Cars were more. That was six months ago. Well, then the Democrats did, for the record, and I think I, on your show I said it. I think I said, I'd wait and see if Biden was the candidate. Mm -hmm. Because a year ago, I realized the Republicans had to go first with their convention. The Democrats went second. 
So I think I called on your show, watch and see if Biden's the candidate. Yep. And that's exactly what happened. And he wasn't the candidate. There was a bad debate. And then post Biden getting out and Kamala Harris getting in, you've seen a third major shift in the language. We may see it shift in the final days again. Mm -hmm. The language went from being about the border, being about immigration, because Republicans lost huge on immigration. Because the bill was in Congress and they voted it down. So now they couldn't talk about immigration anymore. So now it became about security. It became about those who are already here. And that's what you're seeing today. It's about immigrants. It's about safety. Are mm-hmm. you safe with all those people now in the country? Because they're not, the border has been kind of taken care of politically. I think the, se- and the, 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 the other argument is still there. He can't walk away from it. The other guy's old and crazy. But when they switch Biden out, that argument switched on Trump. Mm -hmm. Now, Trump gets that argument rebounded back at him. And more and more, that's becoming a problem for him. And his people know that. And the third one I thought was real interesting. What started out as the economy, which became about inflation. Well, now inflation is under control. I'm not going to say people aren't hurting. People were hurting. Inflation, even though we had inflation in this country, many don't realize we had one of the lowest inflation rates in the world. The world economy impacts us as well, selling goods and services overseas, et cetera. And so, but in America now, our inflation is well under control back to normal over the last two or three years. In fact, the Fed is even cutting interest rates based 100% on inflation. Mm -hmm. So now inflation solved. So now you've seen the flip and you, you mentioned it. The verbiage now is, are you better off than you were four years yep, ago? Yep, absolutely. So, I, I, just that quick analogy as we get into this, because that's how the language on one side has changed. And that's really, to be honest, Trump is the master of framing the debate. He, how close is this election going to be? It is razor close. I think the, it, it's no different than the last two times. Um, I, always, I always don't like to say this because I'm an elections guy. Everyone should vote. But the reality is the votes only matter in seven states. For the president, there are mm-hmm. down ballot things that matter a lot, but there are 43 states today that it, that I would bet my mortgage. I know how 43 states are going to outcome come outcome. Right. We know. Let's just start with we know Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi are all going red. Mm-hmm. The electoral college votes. That's what we're talking about. Sure. The electoral college votes from our four states are going to Trump. Nothing's yeah. going to change that. So I always like to tell people right now in our states, don't lose friends or get upset over or someone's yard sign or a bumper sticker in our state. It's not going to matter. Trump's getting our electoral college votes. Mm-hmm. And there's 43 states like that. Kamala Harris is going to win New York and California. Nothing's going to change that. Yep. Okay. So there's only seven that matter. And we, know, we all know them by now. We've talked about them before. It's mm-hmm. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, the quote blue wall. Mm-hmm. It's Georgia. And to a degree, it's Arizona and Nevada, maybe North Carolina. Okay. That's the seven states we don't know. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing is, I know math. And when you add up the 43 states and you assign those electoral um, votes out there, a magic thing happens. If the Democrats win Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, those three states, they get to 270. And they're in. They actually get to 269. I mean, since some people, they get to 269. They're one vote short of winning, except there are two states that split their electorals, Nebraska and Maine. And so Nebraska, I think, goes 5-1. There's one district in Nebraska that votes blue. It's Omaha. And the Democrats always win Omaha. So assuming they win that Omaha one vote, because Nebraska will be They get to 270. State, they get to 270. Wow. So all she has to do is win those three states, and she wins. Interesting. That's the math. And in yeah. those states right now, she probably has a two- or three-point lead. They're very close nationally. But it doesn't matter if you run the score up in Texas or California. What matters is what happens in those three states. And you can argue now that North Carolina and, to a degree, Georgia might be in play as well. Interesting. When we come back, new DDA director takes over Monday. I want to talk to you about that when we come back. Cedric Lover, so we know. You bet. 101.7 FM, 710 Keel. Now more breaking news and trending talk with Mike and McCarty on 101.7 FM and 710 Keel. Okay. DDA has hired Cedric Glover to be the new director. He starts Monday. Former councilman, mm-hmm. former mayor, yep. former state representative, Absolute, Cedric Glover. Absolutely. We know him. He is uh, very familiar with downtown. He represented downtown. He was instrumental in getting the new uh, state building located there, which they're working on. Um, what are his marching orders going to be? What would you expect he to be told by the DDA? Here's what you got to do in the first year, two years, whatever. 
I, I really see if I, I'll answer this as if I was a DDA member. Okay. I don't know what they've told him. And they've been, to be honest, they've kind of held their cards close mm-hmm. to the vest and, 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 they, and they, they should. But if I were a DDA board member, I'd be looking at three things. I'd be saying, number one, keep the train on the tracks. And, and, in, and in doing that, what I mean is they have a series of contracts. They have a series of services they provide. They have an office staff. I, I think you want that to keep going well. Mm-hmm. I think that, that Liz Swain, and I've known DDA all the way back to Andy Taft when he was a director. Sure. Um, and Liz was a, the, the last director. I think we've made strides in downtown. We've had markets come in. We have people moving downtown. Chica, who works here for the Keel Radio mm-hmm. Network, um, she, she lives downtown. So you've seen some progress. You have these things going on. Keep all that on track. Um, mm-hmm. Number two, I think that you want to address the immediate concerns of downtown. The immediate concerns right now might be things like the um, the police. That's been an issue for the last year. Right. Um, the, what we would call blight. You know, we've got some buildings that certainly need to be in disarray. We have some questions on development right now. The 50 Cent, Curtis Jackson. Um, there's some people starting to raise some questions about those property transactions and or, and or agreements. You know, let's get that up and running. That mm-hmm. can be a great thing. And then, and, then, and then obviously we have some projects underway. You mentioned like the relocation of the state buildings and mm-hmm. those things. And so let's, let's keep that momentum going that's there. And then the third, which is really what I think people always look to DDA for, is provide us a vision. What is your vision? What is yeah. the vision for the city of Shreveport? We've seen Cross Bayou, Cross Bayou Do, Cross Bayou 3. You know, we, we've heard all these things. But what is a practical vision for the long-term managed growth of downtown Shreveport? Gotcha. Good stuff. Jabari Thomas lives right in the Tampa Bay area. He's a local guy who now lives down there. Um, He's going to talk to us about something he's doing uh, in conjunction with KSLA, but we'll catch up with him with regarding to the hurricane, too. That is coming up next, 1017 FM, 710 Key. Stories of the Day with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Key. Oh, my gosh. We have such a special guest right now. Um, Scott Hughes is in for Mike Martindale. Kenny Wayne Shepard. Holy cow. On the Jack Spring Electric Newsmaker Hotline. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Thank you for holding on so long. The Jimi Hendrix Experience is this weekend, Sunday, at Municipal Auditorium. And you are among the amazing guitarists that will be on stage, correct? Yeah, there's a, a pretty incredible lineup, uh, musicians from all kinds of different backgrounds, a lot of great guitar players, all pay, paying tribute to the greatest guitar player of all time, obviously, Jimi Hendrix. Some of the others on the lineup, uh, including Taj Mahal, Dweezil Zappa, uh, Kingfish Ingram, so many more. This is going to be an eight-hour show, it looks like, with all of y'all up there. <laughs> Yeah, we're keeping it down. Uh, it's probably, you know, it's a little over two hours, maybe two and a half, but, you know, it's well worth it. I mean, if you're a fan of guitar music, if you're a fan of rock and roll, um, if you're just a fan of American music in general, it's a great show. I mean, there's somebody from every genre. Like you said, Dweezil Zappa, the son of Frank Zappa, Eric Johnson, guitar virtuoso from uh, Texas, and uh, Zach Wilde, who's very famous for playing with Ozzy Osbourne and Black Label Society, Chris Layton from Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble on drums. Um, the list goes on and on. And obviously yours truly, the hometown boy, uh, closing out the show. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to bringing the show to, obviously, the legendary Municipal Auditorium as well. It's like it couldn't be a, a more perfect venue for a more perfect evening. People can still get tickets and just look up look up the Experience Hendrix Tour and you can find tickets, right? Yep, there should be some more tickets available, uh, but I wouldn't wait just in case because it looks like they're kind of going fast. And like I said, I mean, it's a great setting. It's it's an amazing event. It's hosted by uh, the Jimi Hendrix Estate, so it's an official Hendrix event, and we're playing Hendrix's music, and there's all kinds of collaborations. Basically, from start to finish, it's kind of similar to what the Louisiana Hayride used to be in, 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 a, in a weird roundabout way because, like, it's a revolving door of talent. Once the show starts, it's like one musician after another musician coming on and off the stage, people jamming together, collaborating, uh, but doing all Jimi Hendrix's music. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're busy, busy, busy. So many folks looking forward to seeing it. It's this Sunday, 
the historic municipal auditorium experience Hendrix tour. Uh, the the one and only Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You bet. 1017 FM 710 Keel to Florida. Tampa will go next with Jabari Thomas right here on Keel. At Humana, our Medicare Advantage plans give you coverage and care you can count on, along with guided support to help you feel your best. You could have a plan with a $0 premium or an all-in-one plan that may include medical and prescription coverage, as well as routine dental, vision, and hearing. Learn more at GetHumana.com. Humana, a more human way to healthcare. Humana is a Medicare Advantage HMO and PPO organization with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in any Humana plan depends on contract renewal. Of Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Keel. Back with, gosh, I've known this man since he was uh, quite a youngster. Um, Jabari Thomas. Um, Newport how, native. Yeah. How long have we known? Have, how long have we known each other? Tw- has it been 20 years? Oh, maybe? wow. At least. A long I used to babysit your kids. He did. At the, uh, <laughs> rocking over the red yes, back in the day. Yes, you did. And they were just little tykes. So, uh, yeah. Jabari, you, you now live in Florida. A, I want to ask you. Uh, you're in the St. Petersburg area. How did you fare in the storm? Uh, you know, it's quite difficult. I tell you what, that was something like this area has never experienced, you know. And, you know, I'm on my balcony right now. I'm looking like at the the leftovers of what's left. But to be honest with you, Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg really dodged uh, uh, like a catastrophic, even more a catastrophic event because of the, the hurricane moved south. Had it moved north a little bit more, I don't know know if I would have, you know, had a home. Do you still have power? So, I do. Oh, but wow. Aileen, I lost power for five days. I don't understand it. Wow. But, yeah. Well, I'm so glad you're safe. Your your mom, your family lives here. You grew up here. Uh, Captain Shreve graduate, which we'll forgive you for. I'm a bird family. <laughs> but <laughs> you are doing something really cool. It's called Good News Arklatex. That is going to be on, um, KSLA is going to be airing it. Explain this segment that you're going to be doing. Uh, We need some good stuff in our lives these days, and you're doing exactly that, right? Right. And, you know, when I left Shreveport, I actually got, uh, I left and I went to New Orleans to be an entertainment reporter. Then I went to uh, Tampa Bay, uh, where I spent my last five years being the morning, uh, a previous morning entertainment anchor. And I realized that I had a gift. And that gift was to tell great stories when nobody else would. And I remember recalling going back home to Shreveport and seeing that the crime had gone up and the news was so negative. And I was like, well, maybe I should run for mayor, knowing that I'm not going to really run for mayor. I got too many secrets, but uh, I could actually do something that involves my gift, which is develop stories like I did when I worked in TV all of these years. And, you know, I was a guest host on The View. I've been in more than a dozen films, including Pitch Perfect in CIS New Orleans. And I wanted to take all of these skills that I had and create a show that reflects great people in the Shreveport Bossier community. And uh, the people that usually are on with mugshots are now actually in their communities uh, uh, being heroes, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I have really good guests that I feature, including Coach David McDaniels. He teaches a, uh, a, a group of kids for free. He picks them up in his van to go to basketball practice. Wow. It's incredible, you know. And then Dr. Handy Giles, Sr., the barber in Cedar Grove, the neighborhood that I grew up in, who was my barber when I was a kid, recently had a street named after him. Or even Bunny Jackson, who teaches, uh, you know, the younger kids how to box for free. It's a boxing class for kids of all ages. Mm. And then I also have Joshua Hoover who comes on, who is a local inspirational uh, pastor in the Shreveport Bossier area. So I just really wanted to keep this show positive. I really wanted to show that Shreveport isn't all that bad and that we actually still have great people. Now it's going to air um, Monday, 930 in the morning. Is that right? That's right. This Monday, 930 on KSLA. And is it going to be a weekly show, daily show? What's your plan? So far, it's a one-time show because when you see this, and I've sent you, I think, the screener or the trailer, 
edited all of this by myself. I edited all of this by myself. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> so we are going to, I'm working with KSLA. They kind of want to continue to do this. So we're just going to see how this turns out and just see how the community, you know, responds to this positive news uh, format, if you will. Now, when you, when you're featuring these folks and these stories, uh, you're in Florida. Some of them are here. Do you do it by Zoom? How, how did y'all work that all out? I actually flew to Shreveport about three times oh. to shoot what I needed to shoot. And I'm I'm a beast of a shooter, so I'll shoot two stories in a day. Um, you know, I had uh, Joshua Hoover, actually, the inspirational speaker who I feature in here. Uh, I had him set up a camera and record something for me because, I, you know, he has, he's younger, so he has that technology to do that. But I actually flew in, and then I would fly back out okay. because I'm a host for Monster Jam. Yes. As well, so yes. I travel the world doing <laughs> hosting Monster Jam. So in between, I would come in and shoot these things, and then make these deals with the with the stations, or try to find someone you know to to air it, and then go back. Well, Jabari Thomas, I you know I love you dearly, and I wish you all the success. I'm so glad you're safe down there. Um, will there be a Thank lot of you. cleanup going on? I mean, I know you're looking at it as going to be a lot of work for weeks and weeks to come in your in your area, right? Right. Yeah. And I, I went out a little bit last night and it's just it's just so eerie. It's uh, like there are no lights, really. Uh, all the lights are out. Uh, there were maybe a couple of bars open. There are no gas stations open. And the ones the two that I did see open were just jammed packed oh, with people. Uh, no restaurants. I think I saw a Taco Bell open wow. and that's about it. Wow. Well, we'll be watching you Monday, 930 KSLA. Yes. Good news, Arklatex Live. I, I can't thank you enough for joining us. And you mean the world to me, nope. and I, I'm, I'm so proud of everything you've done. And I just want to encourage everybody to follow me on Facebook as well, Jabari Thomas, uh, Facebook Live at Jabari Live. And, Aaron, thank you so much because you've supported me through all the films I've done. You've actually supported me my entire life life yes. even all the way back when you were on big dog k94.5 yes. getting drunk i remember that <laughs> hey, that's funny hey Don't hey I forgot I, about i'm that. losing you i lost the connection i can't hear you <laughs> jabari i love you man inspiration you take I love you, too. Yeah, you take care of yourself and we'll be watching you on monday thank you sir okay thank you very you much bet. 1017 fm 710 keel the Humana Honor Medicare Advantage Plan gives you $1,680 back each year in your Social Security check. Choose coverage that helps you keep more money in your pocket. Learn more at GetHumana.com. Humana, a more human way to health care. The Part B Give Back Benefit pays part or all of your Part B premium and the amount may change based on the amount you pay for Part B. Limitations and restrictions may apply. Humana is a Medicare Advantage HMO and PPO organization with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in any Humana plan depends on contract renewal. Back to the show with Mike and McCarty on 1017 FM and 710 Keel. All right, Scott, you're going to do this again Monday, right? If I'm allowed back, I mean, it's. <laughs> You give me show prep that asks me all the questions that weren't on the show prep, and I think I may have upset yeah. most of the listening audience today one way or another. But Yeah. Uh, inflation may have decreased, but salaries have not kept up with inflation is one of our comments from our Shreveport Security Systems message board. Respond to that, s'il vous plaît. Um, I think some of the economic data says that salaries are rising. That's a fair argument. Yes, salaries mm -hmm. always trail. Inflation goes up. That means that businesses now must pay more for their products. They have to charge more. Eventually, they get more labor. And you saw a prime example of it last week, the longshoremen. The longshoremen struck, and they got 50% raise. Their salaries are going up. Mm -hmm. And so salaries often trail based on the, in the inflated numbers. So that, that, that will happen. But, um, but overall, inflation has now um, kind of moderated. We have seen um, our economists and the Realtor Association believe we're going to see continued rate cuts over the next year. Um, and let me be clear, because you asked me um, to give some facts and talk about certain mm -hmm. things. Um, but I think I made it very clear that I think that um, in reality, this is a very close race. I think in the end, what's going to matter for the political side of this is who goes and votes. And that sounds trite. We always say that. But 
We're talking about a race last time when Biden beat Trump that was settled by probably less than two or 300,000 votes nationwide mm-hmm. in those seven states. When Trump beat Hillary, the same margin, a couple hundred thousand votes in those key swing states. And we'll see the same thing this time. Yeah. But, but the economic numbers are getting better for the country. We need wages numbers to come up. But we're also now seeing the, 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 the flip side. This was the longshoreman argument as well. You're seeing the impact of automation. You're seeing the, you're seeing automation replacing jobs. Um, and we and we even even though the total workforce grows, it's we live in weird economic the, times and the stock market opens up higher today again for those that have investments in the stock market. But as they say, Wall Street's doing great. Main Street still feeling a little of the pain. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned the in our last minute, <clears throat> the the dock workers pay increase of 50 percent. That's got to come from somewhere. The people that ship those goods and and then own the companies that pay those dock workers come from you and me. That's going to raise prices that we pay on everything they're it, shipping, it, it right? It increases the delivery cost and, and the price of everything's going to go up. It's supply chains. This so country we're going to see more inflation? This country runs on supply chains. And now, I think what's going to happen, though, the dock workers, they have a temporary victory in their 50% pay raise. And if you don't know, the average dock worker makes like $150,000. So we're talking mm-hmm. about they're going to make over $200,000 a year. And I'm, I'm in favor of that. Their labor can get what they what, what they can get. The larger issue they fought for, they did not get, and that's automation. So in the mm-hmm. long run, those ports are going to become more automated, run by guys in buildings running robotic machines. And so ultimately, the costs are going to go down for the shipping. Because they'll need fewer people. Because they'll need fewer people. And that's really, that was a long-term fight over the lo- longshoremen trying to protect their jobs from automation. But mm-hmm. automation will come in the same way it has at Target and banking and gas stations. And pretty soon, there won't be anybody working in the docks. And the, and the cost will go down. If Scott hasn't made you mad today, he will on Monday. He will be back. Oh, thanks for prepping. <laughs> wait, wait, wait to sell me. I'll try to be nice on Monday. Okay, we'll talk about lollipops on Monday. 1017. Tiger victories. Yeah, tiger victories. I love that. Saints victories too, maybe? I, the, Saints, the Saints need a victory. Yeah, we'll see. 1017 FM, 710 Keel.